Well, kia ora tēnā koutou katoa. It's Rachel Froggatt here, Secretary General of the International Working Group on Women in Sport. And for those Kiwis joining us on the line today, of course, Chief Executive here in New Zealand for Women in Sport, Aotearoa. So welcome to the very last episode in our series, Leadership from Lockdown in partnership with Trans Tasman Business Circle, Sports Connect. Um, what an amazing few weeks we've had with this series. I just can't believe that we're, well, in New Zealand at least, uh, now in level one. So the series has now spanned the whole uh, journey for us Kiwis from level four right down to level one. Uh, and as we are starting to move back into, I guess, some semblance of, of normality and some semblance of, of real life, um, we thought that it would be a wonderful opportunity to close down this series and move forward with some, some other ideas. So tune in next week for a couple of uh, quite exciting announcements then. So um, today we're, and, and, and I was just having a run about this, we're signing off with um, an amazing uh, final speaker for the series, uh, someone who is uh, not only a huge stature within the athletic community, but uh, as of yesterday was announced uh, as, as keeping her job, I shouldn't say it that way, but being reappointed as Disability Rights Commissioner in New Zealand for the next five years, which is a really significant appointment um, for us here, because she's continuing to do an amazing job. So just before I introduce her, a couple of bit of uh, housekeeping. For those of you that are regularly with us, you'll know that we'll ask questions for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll open the floor and you can ask whatever you like to our guest speaker today. Towards the end, we'll open a very quick poll just to check uh, how you guys are feeling now, 10 weeks into, into lockdown, uh, and how you're feeling about the future as we go forward as a, as a country and a, as a world uh, dealing with COVID-19. So uh, the final, uh, I guess, comment I'd make here is um, you're all going to have to suffer me as moderator this week. So I'm stepping into some very large shows after Ricky Swanell and Zoe George have uh, very competently handled this, this season for us. Uh, so very excited to be doing this final episode uh, today. So let's get into it. So 25th of March 2020 was a massive day in New Zealand for a couple of reasons. One was because we entered unprecedented level four lockdown and we were all uh, assigned to go home and to stay there for a four week period. But it was also the exact same day that the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games were also announced as being postponed by 12 months. So suddenly training and preparation by our Paralympians and our para-athletes worldwide came to a sudden and very unexpected halt. Uh, and we were dealing with athletes who had been in very, very intense training up until that point, who suddenly weren't even allowed to, to leave their homes. So a very significant change. This week we're talking to Paula Tessarero, Chief Commission of the New Zealand Paralympic Team and as I mentioned, New Zealand's Disability Rights Commissioner. So Paula has uh, not only been planning and working with the team through to Tokyo, but is also advocating now very, um, very loudly and very cleverly in this space around um, making sure that disabled people are more included in society going forward and using COVID-19 as an opportunity. So um, without further ado, I'd really love to say hello to Paula. Hi, Paula. Kia ora, Rachel. Kia ora koutou, everyone. Well, first of all, congratulations on your appointment yesterday, um, an, an amazing one. How are you feeling today about that? Uh, thanks, Rachel. I feel very privileged to be in the role that I'm in, the opportunity to help make a difference for disabled New Zealanders is just such a wonderful opportunity. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, thank you. And of course, um, you've, you've spent the last 12 weeks in, in lockdown. How has that uh, been for yourself and, and for the family? Uh, at a personal level, it's been an incredibly busy time. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk soon about the impacts of COVID-19 on disabled people in New Zealand. But for those first sort of four to six weeks, it was very, very intense. So, you know, I, along with others, were working incredibly long hours and all doing it from home, you know, Zoom meetings, phone calls, all the things that we've become accustomed to now. And uh, so work-wise, it was a, a really busy time and a time where I really felt the... the um, 
sort of privileged pressure, if that's the right way to put it, to try and get things right for disabled New Zealanders and doing it from your home and feeling a sense of actually at times it was quite overwhelming. It was frustrating when we couldn't get traction on things and then there were moments of celebration when we could get traction on things. So it was a very intense time. The, I'm married to Peter and um, between us we've got three kids so we, we were a bubble of five and one of the things that I was super impressed with was just how wonderful the three kids were at their self-directed learning and the resources that they had available to them online. So in many ways that was great that I was um, able to focus on my job and in the knowledge that that the kids were still doing well in their schooling. So I sort of didn't really put my head up for air until probably six weeks into it. Um, and it's continued to be a really busy time, but such a, a really good opportunity as well to think about the, the way forward. And we've talked about you essentially having a dual role at the moment, so the day-to-day -day role and then obviously the role as chef de mission for the Paralympic team. For those people sort of less familiar with the, the Disability Rights Commissioner role, can you explain what that entails? Sure. So the Disability Rights Commissioner is a statutory role and the act which the role sits under is the Human Rights Act of 1993. And so my role broadly is to protect and promote the rights of disabled people and we use the term disabled people rather than people with disabilities because in New Zealand we subscribe to the social model of disability which says I'm not impaired by uh, I'm not disabled rather by the individual impairment that I have but rather I'm disabled by the barriers that society puts in place and so when we talk about the social model it reminds us that we all have a collective role to play in reducing those barriers. So my job is to advocate for the removal of those barriers and there's a range of tools and opportunities I have under the legislation to do that ranging from general advocacy right through to conducting inquiries into areas of concern. So the, I, my role sits within the Human Rights Commission. We're a national human rights institution, um, which obviously in a number of countries around the world have. And broadly, our role is to make sure that the human rights of all New Zealanders are upheld. And then on the chef de mission side, that's a very different role again. Um, and you've been an athlete for, for many, many years. And obviously uh, for those who, who perhaps um, are a bit younger, maybe didn't, didn't see Paula win a gold medal, um, probably what was that, about 12 years ago or so, Paula now in um, Beijing 2008. So what's the role of chef de mission? Uh, it certainly doesn't feel like 12 years ago that I won my medal. Um, many ways it feels like yesterday. But the role of Chef de Mission is really about leading the New Zealand team uh, into and at the Tokyo 2020 Games. And there's a, a, a couple of distinct parts to that. One, you know, my role really is about making sure that the environment in the Games Village is such that our athletes and their support staff um, will perform to the best of their ability. And that means I've got a role in making sure that athletes have what they need, that the support staff have what they need, and also that all of the planning and the steps that we're taking going into the games are such that give me confidence that when we're there, our team will be well placed to deliver the 22 medals that we have as a target to deliver with with 10 to 12 of those being uh, hopefully gold medals so you know really big expectations on delivering medals and delivering results and my job is to make sure that we have an environment in which that can happen and then there's a degree of um, being the public face and a sense of the New Zealand team. So if there's um, media that I need to respond to or talk about um, publicly what's happening at the Games, then I'll be doing that. I mean, obviously we want our medal-winning athletes to be the stars uh, from a media perspective, but there is that role in making sure that the New Zealand public are aware of what's going on and, and dealing with any issues that come up. 
And then I think there's another part of the role, which is about um, making sure that we're working with our stakeholders, with our key partners, both here and in Tokyo, to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to deliver the results that we want to deliver. And uh, you talked a little bit earlier about obviously the role of the, the Disability Rights Commissioner is to protect and promote the rights of disabled New Zealanders. Can you tell us what's happened over the last 12 weeks? You know, I read an, um, an article from you yesterday, actually, where you outlined some of the very difficult challenges that our disabled people in New Zealand have faced. Can you talk us through that? Absolutely. So I think one of the realities about COVID-19 is it's really shone the light on existing gaps that have been present actually for decades. And when you're in a situation where, as you said, it is unprecedented and things were moving fast, lots of things were uncertain at the beginning of our lockdown period, and it really highlighted those gaps. And so there were a number of things that were disproportionately impacting disabled people. And I think one of the things that's important to bear in mind is that you know, disabled people started from behind. So we were probably going to go through this journey always a bit behind. So some particular issues that arose were things around community care workers getting access to personal protective equipment. So we faced situations where disabled people didn't want to have carers in their home because they were concerned about the spread of COVID-19. And also, naturally, we had care workers who, without that gear, were nervous about going into the homes of disabled people. So actually, that put the well-being of many disabled people at risk. We also had issues around access to transport, access to food, uh, which, you know, again, basic necessities in life, um, you know, accessible transport is an issue at the best of times, but when you've got reduced transport and people are trying to get to essential services and can't, that created real difficulty and we saw disabled people relying on emergency services in a way that some people had not had to in the past. We also saw many situations where families who would otherwise have you know, managed very well in this situation where people couldn't access things like respite care, teacher aids, uh, behavioral support therapies and, and services like that, that really exacerbated pressure on families. There were also um, issues around getting the voice of disabled people through into all of the planning and the pandemic response and you know we weren't alone in that but really making sure that we had a, a seat at the table and advocating quite strongly uh, for that. I think one of the other things that you know we saw in New Zealand was a real a genuine fear about what was happening overseas. And at the time, you know, it's easy to look back now and think, oh gosh, thankfully we didn't have to um, deal with this in New Zealand. But actually at the time that we went into lockdown, we were getting reports from overseas about some people getting um, not for resuscitation orders um, or disabled people being at the bottom of the list of, you know, who was going to get life-saving treatment. And although, there hadn't been any comments in New Zealand about that at the time and no reason for New Zealanders to actually um, be nervous. The reality is when disabled people are marginalised, when barriers do exist and when many people still unfortunately see disability as a life not worth living, you know, it really created some genuine fear in the disability community in New Zealand at the time about what does this mean for disabled people? And it, for the first time, I think in a long time, it really got people thinking about, actually, the state might have to decide whose lives are worth living and whose lives are not worth living. And that was really profound. Thankfully, we didn't have to make those rationing decisions that they had to make in other countries. 
but it's really, really important that we confront some of these things so that if we face that in the future, we are well prepared and we know how to have these conversations. And I think one of the other sort of things I'll just, just finish up on in terms of impacts was access to information. So one of the really pressing concerns from the disability community uh, during COVID was not getting information in accessible formats. So at a time where information was changing, sometimes by the hour, disabled people were often days behind getting up-to-date information. And that put people on the back foot. So lots of work was done to remedy that, but it was quite late in the piece and it did mean that people missed out on key information. So, you know, there were some quite negative impacts that said, there's also been some positives that we can take out of this. And some of those positives were things like the Ministry of Health moving really quickly to create more flexible funding arrangements so that people could access their support in, in different ways. And that's something, you know, we really want to see uh, continue. We did see government agencies breaking down silos and working together in a much more collaborative way for the benefit of disabled people. And again, that's something we want to see continue. Uh, and I think there's been some initiatives announced through the budget that we'll have an opportunity to influence. So, um, you know, I think it's, as I said at the start, it really shone the light on gaps for disabled New Zealanders and in the spirit of the social model, you know, we've all got a responsibility to help um, break down those barriers. I think, I mean, that in itself, the, the, the idea that there was fear in the community about choices being made about your life is just such a horrifying thought that, you know, 80% of New Zealanders wouldn't have even occurred to them that that was even something that was happening because if you're not experienced with disability, um, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't even, it, it, you know, factor on your radar. And I think the other thing I read in your article yesterday, which was really, um, it was quite striking, I think, just in its simplicity, was access to food, which you mentioned. And, you know, the number of people that I heard complaining about having to stand in line or not being able to get a slot on the countdown delivery or all those things, and not realizing that that's that's actually a life or death choice for some people in our community. They can't, they don't have that access and they can't get a slot means they can't actually eat. So having to deal with that was is, is just horrifying. So um, thank you for all of your work advocating in this space. I think it's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, I'm conscious of time ticking and I know I can start, to, I can see we're starting to get some questions in now. So I'm going to ask you about the Paralympic Games um, before I open the floor to, to more questions. So um, as an athlete yourself, you, you would have had enormous empathy, I think, with what our athletes have gone through in New Zealand in the last you know, 12 weeks. Can you explain both from an athlete perspective and also as Chef de Mission, what the post moment really means? Absolutely. Look, I think, you know, this, <laughs> most athletes um, will have probably this year done what I did in the, in 2008, when you woke up in that new year, and it was, you know, this is the year of the games, everything you've been working towards. And, uh, you know, this has, has really caused a shift and a, and a need to, to reset plans and goals. And, um, you know, I think we need to acknowledge that that's pretty profound for, for athletes. And some athletes will do the reset uh, and, and look positively towards the games much more quickly than some other athletes will be able to do. Uh, but it's certainly meant for our para-athletes that, like other New Zealanders, they were locked down at home and so relied on, um, you know, through the great work that Paralympics New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand did, were able to kit out their uh, garages and things and create gyms and they were sharing that information online. Paralympics New Zealand also made sure that our athletes had access to their coaches, to sports psychologists, to sports nutritionists and all the ordinary athlete services um, you know, in, in an online way and did everything they could to, to support athletes. And uh, I think the, the big challenge really uh, now is 
re-planning, resetting towards the games, making, you know, really hoping, I guess, that the rest of the world's response to COVID um, gets to the, a similar place to New Zealand so that we, you know, we have full confidence in next year, but we're, you know, we're, we're full steam planning ahead towards the games. And, you know, a really big challenge within that, of course, is stretching that funding for a longer period of time. We know that, you know, 35% of the funding for Paralympics New Zealand comes from uh, non-government sources. And at a time when the economy has been, you know, so impacted through this, that's going to create challenges uh, for all sport, but in this case for, for Paralympics New Zealand. So um, they are working very hard and very closely with partners to try and you know, remedy that as we, we head in. So look, it's been a, it's been a tough time um, for, you know, for everyone. And I guess, you know, our athletes are um, resilient. There's hallmarks of being an athlete, I think, that mean you sort of have to get back up, pick yourself up, dust yourself off and, and keep going on. But I don't think we should underestimate the impact and, you know, the profoundness of that and um, what it takes to really reset and move everything a year, a year away. Mm, absolutely. And for those of you that are listening, if you are um, keen to support our Paralympians, they are taking donations on their website, so paralympics.org.nz, if you would like to make a contribution towards helping our athletes get to Tokyo. Um, so we've got quite a few questions now, so I'm actually going to open up to the floor. So anybody who's sitting there and has a burning question, please do drop it into uh, the chat function and we'll start uh, working our way through them. So this first one's a really interesting one. So, and it is a question around how does the increased movement towards working from home open up opportunities for disabled people to be more engaged in, in business and uh, in careers? Yeah, it opens up huge opportunities. So the employment stats in New Zealand are not great. So half the number, about 50% of, um, um, sorry, I'll start that stat again. Disabled people have um, twice the unemployment rate of non-disabled people. And with young disabled people, you know, there's 35% of young disabled people not engaged in education, training or employment. That was pre-COVID and that was at a time when our economy was doing really well. And so there's lots of work to be done there. And one of the really common um, reasons that... Uh, disabled people have found it difficult to get employment is because employers won't or don't or don't know how to make those reasonable accommodations that are often needed. And the biggest reasonable accommodation actually relates to location and flexible working hours. And so often disabled people have uh, missed out on roles or not been able to apply for roles because there hasn't been that reasonable accommodation. And now actually working from home has become the norm for not only Kiwis, but people around the world. And I think that's really opened up our minds to seeing actually how easy it is to do this. And I'm really hoping that that continues and that when we say we don't want to return to the way things were, that we're really genuine about that and that employers really look at this as a way to harness the awesome skill sets that exist um, that they miss out on at the moment with disabled people. I think the other thing is, you know, this, this interesting time we've been in has focused our minds on thinking about technology and what we can do with technology. And actually many technological advancements have benefited all people, although they've been um, created for disabled people and so actually if you're a business out there and you want to be creating some smart technology then working with disabled people is one way to help achieve that so I think there's huge opportunities in the em employment space for disabled people coming out of this if, especially if we are really genuine to that idea of holding on to flexible working options and I think one of the things, obviously, that um, is quite prevalent is, is unconscious bias within, within the employment environment. You know, is, is this a, an opportunity to reset? You know, can New Zealand become more inclusive? And how, how do we do that? 
that's always my hope that we continue to be more inclusive. You're right about, you know, there are a number of myths around why employers um, are reluctant to hire disabled people. And actually when, you know, you can really bust those myths down actually, and they just, they just don't stack up to the evidence. And also um, stigma and low expectations that people can often have of disabled people. And, you know, we've got a, I think, uh, a responsibility and an opportunity to really um, create a social change movement, which is, you know, in part what Paralympic sport is all about. You know, one of its key goals is creating that social change movement and, you know, big opportunity um, to do that coming out of this. And, you know, I... I think that we have to seize the opportunity to really create a more diverse um, and, and inclusive New Zealand coming out of this. We're going to see, um, you know, we're already seeing inequities that have um, been generated through COVID and we've seen inequities that have been highlighted that have already existed. and you know, a, a way in which we can start to address those is by creating a much more inclusive New Zealand and, and having equity as a real focus of, of where we get to. And it's, it's quite a good um, transition into one of the questions we, we have here and a question that I have as well, uh, is obviously you're, you're very active within the women in sport community still, and we see you quite often at, uh, at different parts of, of, of that sector. You know, this inclusivity, how do we extend that into sport? And, and I'll talk about that with, through the gender lens, but also through the disability lens. Can we do better in sport? Oh, we can absolutely do better. I mean, starting from the disability perspective, you know, sport's a great leveller and sport is uh, a way in which, you know, from a very young age, non-disabled children can observe how disabled kids um, can participate in sport. And so right from a very young age, sport creates that really lovely opportunity for people to see what inclusion is all about. I think from a gender lens, um, you know, Paralympic sport has, um, you know, has come a long way on that front. So in at the Rio Games, there was, you know, more, there was double the number of female athletes that there was back in 1996 in, in Atlanta. And in Rio, um, you know, 43% of um, women competed in 43% of all of the medal events. And, you know, again, that was an increase on the London Games by about 12%. So, you know, you're seeing that participation grow. Um, but that said, the number of people who stood for the number of women who stood for the IPC board, um, you know, is still lower than, than we would hope. So I think, you know, we've we've all got those challenges. And I think that, um, you know, women um, across all abilities and across all types of sport, um, you know, have faced over the years that, that um, push for equality. And when you add impairment um, to that, you've sort of got that double whammy or that, that sort of what we call intersectionality between those two identities. And, I think the, you know, the, the big challenge um, for para-athletes is not so much about the gender, um, although that, that is a, a focus and it's one that both the International Paralympic Committee and Paralympics New Zealand are really mindful of. I think actually the bigger challenge is that equity between para-sport and non-para-sport. You know, I still remember, and admittedly it was 12 years ago and we've come a long way, but, you know, the the celebration of um, and, and recognition of my gold medal was poles apart from Olympic gold medalists. And, you know, that really sticks with me as, as such a, a point of inequity. And, um, you know, so I think for para-athletes, there is that, that double whammy of inequity. And, 
you know, I always encourage women's organisations to really focus on the fact that women are not a homogenous group of people. You know, we, we have multiple identities and we need to do better across all fronts. And that transitions quite well into this question. So we see the areas of sport and recreation merging. So where does this now enhance opportunities for people with disabilities or disabled people, to use your phrasing, to participate in community sport? I think, you know, community sport is, is where it all starts, right? It's that pathway towards elite um, competition. And, you know, both uh, Paralympics New Zealand and organisations like the Halberg Foundation here in New Zealand do, do great work at um, trying to open up opportunities for young disabled people in community sport. I think the, the, the trick is for every club in every national sporting organisation in New Zealand to think about the disability lens across their sport. Is their sport accessible? Is their club accessible? Um, is their representation on their board, on their club you know, membership and secretariats? And you know, how can they make their sport more accessible and I'd encourage clubs and sports organizations to touch base with Paralympics New Zealand with the Halberg Foundation um, and you know try and make your sport more accessible because you know it, access to sport and rec it is one of those rights that we've enshrined in the international convention on the rights of persons with disabilities and New Zealand signed up to that we've all got you know obligations and responsibilities around that. The government's uh, recent package of um, budget announcements also will be investing more in this area. And, you know, I think that it's not good enough to be a club anymore in New Zealand and not have that disability lens to what it is that you're doing. 24% of um, New Zealanders are disabled. It's a huge share of the population and you know sport and recreation is critical for everyone and it's interesting just to touch on a, an earlier point you made you know the the women in sport community has has been quite vocal about our concerns about women's sport being cut um, in terms of finances and resourcing because of COVID-19 and you know are you seeing that in the disability space as well you know is, is disabled sports sitting in the and the loss side of the, the profit and loss and therefore is exposed to risk? Oh, I, I think all sport is exposed to risk right now. And um, I, I think particularly when there is that, that uh, reliance on government funding, but also a, a share of the funding that comes from um, the private sector and um, you know, other charitable sort of donations and things, you know, all of that's going to be slimmer in this environment. And so that is going to, I think, require a change in, in the way that sports organise, the way that it's run. And, you know, that, that's going to be a real challenge. Hopefully it, it's also an opportunity, but, you know, I think that disability sport uh, will have the, the same challenges and that's why I'm, I'm really hoping that um, sport in New Zealand will, you know, we can target some of that investment to, to uh, really promote inclusion. So we're gonna, gonna jump out of, um, over to Malaysia actually. We've got Lee Niel Tai who is uh, beaming in. Congratulations to you and to New Zealand for progressing so much. You have come a long way for disabled people. Malaysia is still quite behind in inclusive, inclusivity for the disabled community and for education uh, in society is not there. What is your advice and what are the steps that Malaysia and other countries alike can take to move us forward faster to becoming a more disabled friendly country and how can sport be used to expedite that process? Whew, there's a lot in that. Um, thank you for that question. I think my starting place um, would be that, you know, I, I think often it can be tempting for us to compare ourselves to different countries and 
people will often say to me in my role, oh, but Paula, you know, we're doing so well compared to this country or that country. But actually, we're not doing as well as we can do as a country. And that's by our own standards, but also, you know, the, the United Nations have told us in our first examination of how New Zealand's going against our international obligations, they have said, you know, we're not doing well enough and we need to do more. And, you know, I think that, that we need to um, uh, really judge our performance by what disabled New Zealanders uh, think and, and at the end of the day, you know, it's never going to be good enough in my view for us to be a little bit behind in New Zealand. Actually, we don't want to be behind at all. I think to offer some thoughts and reflections for other countries, you know, I, I think obviously being party to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is, is pretty pivotal. And what that does is then create those domestic obligations um, within countries. And if you can then get that enshrined in domestic legislation, um, then that's uh, uh, even better. What we did in New Zealand um, that I think has helped frame the way that we have progressed some rights is we have a New Zealand disability strategy. And then underneath that, we have an action plan which has been developed in partnership between government and disabled people. And that has set some shared commitments. Um, now that that hasn't been easy to develop over the years, but we're now in a in a position where it's become much more of a natural thing to do. So I think some of that architecture and framing helps. But um, I wouldn't want anyone to be under the illusion that we are there in New Zealand because we are most certainly not across you know, housing education, transport, a lack of data about disabled people, uh, our employment stats. Um, you know, we have far too many disabled people uh, in poverty in New Zealand. So, you know, we, we have a long way to go, despite the fact we have made some inroads in some places, like other countries. Another question here, can you share the changing role for carers in the future? Will there be more demand? And if so, do we have the labor force to meet those needs? Um, no, we don't have the labor force at the moment. Um, that workforce development and, and how we actually cater for our older um, you know, we have an aging population in New Zealand and we have, um, you know, a, a disability population. And uh, so we, so workforce developments are a really big thing. And the role of carers, um, I think, will, it will change as uh, in the sense that the model now that New Zealand is trying to move to is around disabled people having the choice and control over who cares for them. So in the past, it's been, well, here's your selection of organisations, and now it's, it's much more geared towards what do disabled people want at an individual level. And I think that's going to change the nature of uh, the way organisations operate. It opens up opportunities for families to also care for people. There's been some changes in respect of that. And also, um, you're going to see people um, who can contract with individuals to provide their care. So, um, lots of changes in that space. Um, it's, it's referred to as system transformation if people want to go and find out more about it on the Ministry of Health um, website. And uh, another question, you describe the definition of disabilities as extending beyond the physical. Where does your work actually end if socioeconomic barriers are <laughs> um, <or> the question? <laughs> yeah, so the, um, the way that the International Convention uh, talks about disability is it is um, it's physical, it's um, um, psychological, sensory. Um, it covers a, a very 
broad spectrum. And so to the extent that, um, you know, I talked about the social model and, and the barriers that exist, those barriers are across um, most every facet of, of life. So, you know, I think I pretty much deal with almost every government agency, obviously some more than others, but, you know, there, there's no service or, or um, product that is created in New Zealand that doesn't have to meet the needs of disabled people. And so uh, it's, it's a very broad ambit in that respect. And, you know, I work with stakeholders um, who represent people from all types of different impairments. And it's one of the things that I love about my job because I've really grown and learned about such a wide range of impairments that I was less familiar with, you know, a decade ago. So we've probably got time for one or two more questions. So uh, here's, a, here's a big Paralympic one. Um, you medaled in Beijing and now you lead the New Zealand team to Tokyo. Are there any differences between competing in Asia compared to competing in the rest of the world for disabled people? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'd be, I'd be interested in other people's views on, on that. I think that um, I'm, not, I'm not sure so much as I'd see it as sort of um, almost kind of e ethnic based. I think different parts of the world um, in terms of attitudes towards disabled people, in terms of socioeconomic status, um, how far the rights of disabled people have been advanced. I think all of those things um, impact. And, you know, I think that, you know, one of the um, things that was talked about in Beijing and it's been talked about around Tokyo, um, but it also was talked about in London was how do you use the Paralympics to really create that, that, that driving power of um, inclusion? And, you know, I don't, I don't think, in my mind, I don't necessarily see it as, as different ethnic groups that are more advanced than others. I think there's a wide range of things that go into that that are probably too complex to get into today. But, yeah, thank you for the question. Well, I can see that Sharon's popped up, so I'm going to ask one last question and then hand over to her to, uh, to wrap things up. Um, and I'm going to pick this one because it actually feeds into a thought I'd had earlier when you were talking about COVID-19 and the impact on, on our um, disabled Kiwis. So where does your work end and mental health issues and organisations start? And my question is, has lockdown adversely affected our disabled community in New Zealand? And are you seeing an emergence of mental health issues, for example? Uh, so in terms of my work around mental health, yes, um, it, it, it absolutely is included in that definition of disability. Um, and uh, so very much I, I have an interest and an involvement in, in, um, in that area of work. Like I think that time will tell, you know, we, we are a country um, that has really, you know, been grappling with some very significant issues around mental health and, and suicide. And, you know, lots of work has been done to really try and, and, and change all of that and, you know, big investments made last year to address some of that. My... Um, suspicion is that we will see an increase in the number of, of people wanting to access different types of support services and I'm basing that really only on the likely scenarios of you know the impact on our economy the um, social impact um, and inequities that have already um, arisen through COVID and, and will be with us for the coming years. And, and, you know, if we get another wave of this, then that's another very difficult period to go through. So I think, you know, my, my sense is we, we will 
see an increase, um, but to what extent, how much and how well the country can, can respond, I think remains to be seen. Um, but I think that, you know, a really, perhaps a nice way to finish that question is, is that sense that we are all in this together. And, you know, that's been a real sort of catchphrase from the beginning of this. And I think, you know, we, we need to look to our communities, we need to look towards each other and, and really keep an eye out for each other. Well, thank you very much, Paula. We've run out of time and I apologise uh, to everybody that still had questions waiting. There were quite a few of them there. So if you are uh, still keen to have those answered, you can email those through to us and we can pass them on to Paula. And if she has a moment, I'm sure she'll um, be able to get back to you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sharon, but just quickly say before I do, a massive thank you to Sharon, to Dora, to Tracy and all of the team at the Trans-Tasman Business Circle for their epic support over the last 10 weeks as we conduct the Leadership from Lockdown series. I feel a bit uh, but sad that we're, we're bringing it to an end actually after all of this time, but it's been a wonderful few weeks. Um, a huge thank you again to Ricky Swanell and Zoe George for moderating through the series um, and to all of our speakers all over the world. We've, we've bounced around a bit from Auckland to Zurich to Dublin to London to Melbourne um, and back to Auckland and it really has been amazing. So I'll hand over to Sharon now um, but thank you everyone for, for dialing in. Thank you Rachel and thank you to you and Paula for your time today. Um, the poll is in front of you now for those of you who join us regularly you'll be familiar with this if you wouldn't mind answering those questions and I'll, I'll give you the results before we sign off. Um, Paula thank you so much for your time today what an honour to host you and you know you certainly gave us such a brilliant um, insights into the communities in which you work together with and um, certainly a lot of things for me to consider that I hadn't and I'm sure many people on the call would feel the same so really appreciated um, you being so open and honest about sharing across so many different topics today we got a lot of um, things covered so thank you for that it really was a brilliant way to, to conclude the series and Rachel, we, we've loved working together with you, sending the love right back to you and Women in Sport Aotearoa. It's been a wonderful series and I remember us talking um, very early on in, in week four of lockdown and saying we have to do something and I think that we can be very proud of, of what we've pulled together over the last 10 weeks and um, the, the amazing conversations that we've had and we've just loved every minute of it. So thank you so much to you. Uh, so the polls in front of you now, excellent. We're still feeling innovative, 77% of us. 92% believe the government doing a good job in this crisis. Majority believing 12 months is an estimate of when this will be over. And priority of women and girls during recovery phase medium is the, the average here, 54%. Um, so thank you again to both of you. And Paula, I'll hand over to you to say goodbye to everyone. Uh, Namahi nui. Um, thank you, Rachel, Sharon, Dora, Tracy, and others, and people who have brought this together. I think it's a great idea, great concept. Um, you know, I think that we're at a really, really interesting time in, well, globally, but, but, you know, in New Zealand around, you know, this time of rebuild. And, you know, in part, yeah, that's about literally rebuilding and, and investing in infrastructure and there's big opportunities to you know build in concepts of universal design and make New Zealand a more accessible place but it's also about rebuilding it, I think as a nation and you know reflecting on those gaps that we all saw and you know I think for the first time probably um, non-disabled New Zealand has got a taste of what it's like to be restricted in their movement, to feel a sense of loneliness and isolation. And, you know, I hope that a positive from that is that we all become a bit more empathetic and that we can all start to think about our collective role in reducing barriers and creating equity. And sport has a uh, a big role to play in there because it's about participation and I think we've got to risk you know every club every sport in New Zealand has a responsibility to really make their sport accessible and that's great for sport and it's great for New Zealand so thank you to everyone who has been listening um, please feel free to get in touch at any stage on any of the issues that I've, I've talked about and those that you 
you um, haven't had a chance to ask about uh, and let's keep this really important conversation going. So, namahi nui kia koutou.